Excellent. Well, I know from the few conversations I got involved in that there were a lot of really useful connections made at lunch and a lot of discussions. And I trust that we'll have some time to connect at the next break as well and afterwards and that people will value the contact information that they've gotten from others here. This session is uh, titled New Approaches to Unmet Needs, Communication for the Whole Community. And it has a couple of different aspects to it. So we're gonna start first with um, a um, pr presentation by Wendy Brundebrun, who's at the University of Southern California. And she is going to talk about a topic that is near and dear to all of our hearts, I think, is how to be clear and improve risk communications. And we will follow her talk with a short Q&A on her talk, and then we'll move to our next two speakers. The goals of this session are to identify current and emerging strategies, barriers, and challenges for communicating uncertainty and probabilistic information about tropical cyclone, cyclones, and to highlight unmet needs in communities at risk from tropical cyclones and potential solutions to meet those needs in the context of communication. Wendy, are you there? I see Wendy's yes, slide. I, do you, can you hear me, Anne? Yes, and now I can see you. Great, great. your slides look great. Take it away, thank you so much. Yeah, um, thank you for uh, having me uh, at this workshop. I'm really sorry I couldn't be there in person. I had teaching obligations, but I'm happy to join online. So my name is Wendy Bruin de Bruin. I'm a provost professor of public policy, psychology, and behavioral science at the University of Southern California. And in my research, I study um, how people perceive health risks and environmental risks. And I also study how to best design messages and interventions to inform the decisions of practitioners and policymakers, as well as of people themselves to improve protection against risks. And um, in research on risk communication, um, it has been found that if you want to help people to protect against risk, it's important to be correct and to be clear, among other things. And it's my experience that experts often work very hard on getting the science right. So they're really worried about making sure that their messages are correct. But message wording is often an afterthought. And so um, when experts design messages, they have a tendency to use complex language with which they themselves are very comfortable and that complex language is useful for communications between experts in their domain, but they're not necessarily, it's not necessarily the best language for communications uh, with people outside of their domain and for members of the general public. Um, and before I continue, I wanna highlight that there is a social science method for improving effective messages. And it starts by identifying your recommendations, but also it includes finding out why people may not follow those recommendations. So you can do interviews and surveys with your target audience. Then we design messages to address why people may not follow recommendations and the message design is based on our findings as well as uh, the literature that suggests what works and what doesn't work. And then finally, it's important to test messages. So we uh, randomly assign people to different messages to find out which ones are better at improving understanding of risk and helping people to protect themselves. And of course, it's important to use this process to design messages in advance of a crisis so that messages are ready to go when the crisis hits and you have some confidence that those messages will be effective with your audience. Now, experts in many domains often use technical terms. Uh, and I wanted to give an example of um, the problems with that uh, from a project that I uh, worked on with the United Nations Foundation. Uh, this project looked at climate change communications. Um, as you may or may not know, the United Nations Foundation convenes the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and they communicate about uh, climate science to uh, uh, policymakers, practitioners, and members of general public around the world. We asked the climate scientists who were working on those reports to identify key terminology that they thought would be central to understanding climate change and climate change communications. And you can see those terms on this screen. Um, today, I'm gonna to talk about two of those terms because they're central to behavior change. The first one is mitigation. And when climate scientists use mitigation, they are referring to the things that you can do 
to reduce your impact on climate change. And then the second term is adaptation. And that refers to the things that you can do to protect yourself against the climate change that is already happening. So the climate scientists identified those terms. And then what we did is we interviewed members of the gender, general public in the United States about these terms. So we asked them, how easy are those terms to understand? And um, can you define those terms in your own word? Uh, and I want to start by a quote from one interviewee that sort of um, reflects the general sentiment in those interviews. One interviewee said, they're talking way over people's heads. Now let's dig a little deeper. So um, we asked people about mitigation and we asked um, them to rate it on a scale, meaning scale from one to five, with one meaning not very easy and five meaning very easy. The average rating was 2.5, which is below the midpoint of three, suggesting it was perceived as not that easy to understand. And then when we asked people to define mitigation in their own words, they often struggled. And uh, one example is that somebody said, oh, mitigation, uh, isn't that helping to resolve a conflict? So they confused mitigation with mediation. Then for adaptation, it was rated as relatively easy to understand. But just because people think a term is easy to understand doesn't mean that they define that term in the same way that the, the experts do. And so for adaptation, a common definition that we heard is, oh, adaptation, that's easy to understand. I know what that means. It means turning a book into a movie. And of course, that is what adaptation means in everyday language, but it's not what it means in the context of climate science. And so uh, maybe it's not a good idea to use these technical terms because people may struggle with them and interpret them in a way uh, that makes sense in their day-to-day -day lives. So we also asked interviewees to suggest simple wording to talk about the terms. Uh, and, that, and people uh, suggested some ways to talk about these words. So for mitigation, um, they suggested uh, you could talk about it by saying, actions we can take to stop climate change from getting worse. And for adaptation, they suggested, well, you can talk about that by saying actions we can take to protect against climate change. So it is possible to talk about these complex topics in, in a simple way. And then you might ask, well, are the words we use to talk about tropical cyclo cyclones clear? Um, well, um, I could not find uh, systematic wording um, experiments, but maybe I missed some. I did find some suggestions that there are terms that may be difficult for people to understand. One example is shelter in place. So when experts say shelter in place, they uh, tend to mean that you should stay inside and not expose yourself to whatever risk is outside. Um, it turns out that uh, some people misinterpret the term shelter in place to mean that they should go outside and find the nearest public shelter. And they may not know where it is, so that means they'll be looking around for it. And um, so perhaps it's better to not say shelter in place, but instead, instead say, say that people should stay inside. Storm surge is also a term that may be confusing and people don't necessarily mean why they're uh, at risk for it if they know what it is. Uh, there seems to be some confusion between terms like hurricane watch and hurricane warning or tornado watch and tornado warning. And then there is uh, there are a number of studies that suggest that people are confused uh, about the cone of uncertainty. Um, and that inclusion of the cone of uncertainty in a message may draw attention away from recommendations about how to protect oneself. And there may be other terms that haven't been tested. So what is wrong with using complex language? Just to reiterate, complex language can be hard for people to understand. The average US adult reads at the seven or eighth grade reading level. Um, and experts tend to communicate at the university level. Also, complex language is generally not liked. Even people who read very well tend to prefer simple, clear messages. And complex language can be so off-putting that people don't even want to interact with complex messages. And complex messages may not work, and they can put people's lives at risk. 
So how do you simplify your messages? Well, the general recommendation from research on risk communication is that messages will be easier to understand if they are written at the grade seven reading level or lower. Um, there are various websites where you can uh, paste your text, message text into the website and it will tell you the reading level at which you've writ written it. Um, there are statistics such as the Flash Kincaid readability statistic that will tell you the readability of your text. Um, also, it's important to avoid jargon, though I realize if you're an expert in a domain, you may not always recognize when you're using jargon. So another rule of thumb is to use short words. So words of one or two syllables tend to be more commonly used in everyday language and more widely understood. Say use instead of utilize, for example. And then also use short sentences. Of course, simple language may still lead to some confusions if it doesn't address what people still need to know. So it's also important to get feedback from members of the intended audience. So you can do interviews and surveys, as well as randomized experiments to find out what works best for promoting um, understanding and behavior change. And social scientists can help because you know social scientists may not be experts in tropical cyclones or in climate change, but social scientists like myself have extensive training in doing interviews and surveys to find out how people perceive risks and um, also in designing and testing messages to find out which messages might be most effective at promoting understanding and helping uh, to implement uh, behaviors that uh, protect people against the risk. So um, thank you very much for your attention. Um, my contact information is on the slide and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Wendy. So we'll take questions from the room. Yes, Jessica. Thanks, Wendy. That was a great presentation and it echoes a lot of what we've been talking about at the workshop about jargon. So in talking with experts, though, um, sometimes, though, at least the ones I've talked to, so this is completely anecdotally, but they feel that using these jargon or technical terms gives themselves a degree of credibility. So it's a cue that they're an expert in something, and so they feel that's important to convey for people heeding their recommendations. So I'm wondering what you would tell those experts who want to use technical terms to convey their expertise. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Um, ex there's um, some experts in various domains may have some resistance to using simple wording because they want to sound like an expert and they feel like their complex language is the right language to use and simple language is not exactly what they mean. But the thing is, if your point is to uh, communicate, to improve um, understanding in a particular community, you need to use the words of that community. Um, and uh, but uh, so I tend to try to convince them by uh, citing the research on that. But generally, I find what is the most effective is actually doing interviews, doing interviews with their intended audience to find out how those preferred expert terms are interpreted by that audience, because then you can actually show the confusion that people have. And so um, that's why I worked with the United Nations uh, and United Nations Foundation on climate change terminology, because they found some resistance among climate scientists in terms of using simpler wording. And so if you have the budget and the time to do these interviews, I think that's the most effective. Great, Great question, Mickey. Thank you. Um, other questions in the room? Yes. Uh, hi, thank you for your presentation. I'm interested to know uh, if you find any uh, distinction in best practices around this uh, when it comes to the medium of communication, like if there's um, a tendency to lean in towards complexity or simplicity if you're delivering something over television versus over radio or versus over print and how that complicates messaging. Um, I must admit that I have not studied that, and I'm not even sure that I know about studies that I've looked at that, but just from personal experience, it seems to be that uh, written reports tend to be more complex, but uh, there's even a tendency for experts to use complex language in um, like text messaging and, and, and warnings that go out when it's really not the right place for it. Excellent. And do we have any questions online? 
No. Um, I was going to ask uh, one follow-up question, Wendy, before we switch to the next panel. And when you're facing a situation as you are in many, maybe not in warning situations per se, but in many other communications contexts around tropical cyclones, for example, or climate change, where you have a mixed audience and there are, you know that there are members of the expert audience that feel like they need to use technical terms to be precise. How how do you deal with the the um, the the tension between the two in those kinds of mixed audiences? Well, even for mixed audiences, it's generally the case that people who are um, uh, good at reading, they're highly educated, the simple messages tend to be more clear. Um, it's only when you talk, when you design communications for your own expert community that it may be important to use that complex language. But if you must use the complex words, then I would say, sure, use them, but um, then also uh, describe what you mean by them in everyday language so you can tailor, uh, target both audiences in your messaging. But I'm not sure that it's always necessary to use those complex terms. This reminds me of David Badescu's advice on um, communicating where you're better off using the numbers and the words and, instead yes. of skipping one or the other. So thank you very much, Wendy. I really appreciated this. Thank you. So now I have the pleasure of moving to our panelists. We have Lace Padilla from Northeastern University and Jessica Holman from Northwestern University. We didn't plan it that way. <laughs> And, and uh, Lace, are you there? Um, yes, yes, I'm here. I will turn it over to you. Okay. Great, thank you so much for that introduction. My name is Lise Padilla. I'm an assistant professor of computer science and psychology at Northeastern University. And I also served as a disaster risk management and behavioral consultant for the World Bank. Now I have studied hurricane visualizations for many years. And I'm going to show you some of the work in that space and then focus in on a specific study to talk about in detail. In some of this early work, we were looking at different ways to represent the trajectory of the storm, including the cone of uncertainty down in the bottom left and a few other techniques that we came up with. We've also looked at animated techniques to represent the size of the storm and its uncertainty, and also the wind speed estimates and their positional uncertainty with animations. We've further looked at ways to represent the size of the storm and the distribution of uncertainty around the potential size of a storm. We have further work looking at how people do different tasks and think about both size and intensity when thinking about these ensemble displays and the cone of uncertainty. And we have more recent work where we've come up with new techniques to represent the trajectory, the intensity of the storm, and the size of the storm. More recently, we've been looking at different biases that people have when understanding these. Now, I want to focus on the type of visualization you most often see, which is the cone of uncertainty. It's based on a pseudonormal distribution with a 66% confidence interval. Now, we as scientists wanted to understand how people reason with these. And what we did in some of our earlier work is we would show people these hurricane forecasts and ask them to estimate something that could help us infer how they interpret these visualizations. In this case, we asked people to estimate damage. And we would show people location on the map, tell them that this was an offshore oil rig, and have them estimate the damage that would incur at that particular location. The reason we do this is that we don't like asking people about probability estimates. The true probability of the hurricane affecting any one area is actually zero, or any specific location is zero, and people are very hard have, have difficulty interpreting probability. So, so that's why we chose to use this damage rating scale. And damage is nice because it is complex, it includes uncertainty, and it can some way help us get indirect evidence about how people are reasoning with these. Now we've compared the cone of uncertainty to an ensemble technique, which is on the right, that my collaborators came up with. The way that they generate these is we take the same underlying forecast model used to create the cone of uncertainty, make small perturbations to the model, and then we sample from perturbation space. And each one of those lines represents one of those samples. I'm recognizing I'm using lots of jargon, <laughs> which is you know, not what the last speaker said to do, um, but that's technically what, what these are. 
Now, the nice thing is that they show the distribution of the possible trajectories of the storm very intuitively if you don't know all of that jargon. You can start to see where many of the lines are grouped together and areas that are, are less likely for the storm to go. Now, we compare the cone of uncertainty to that ensemble, and we do so at two different time points in the forecast, either two days along the forecast or four days. So I'm going to move this up. And I'm going to focus on that top time point for the cone of uncertainty, bring those points down, and plot it on our damage rating scale. One is low damage, seven is severe damage. So here are the responses from our participants. And the first thing I'll point out is that we see a steep drop off in damage that just so happens to correspond with points being inside and outside of the cone. So essentially, people see the cone and they think there is an area of damage, and just outside the cone, there is significantly less damage. And this is uh, there's an underlying distribution there, so that's a misconception. We do the same thing for ensemble. We bring the points down, plot it against our damage rating scale. Here are the responses. And this looks a little bit like a normal distribution with three standard deviations. And we're starting to see a kind of a nice steady drop off and there's no inside outside the cone effect. So that's at least one misconception that people don't have with our ensemble. We can do the same thing for the other time point. We'll bring those dots down and here are the responses. I'll point out to you that overall, People have a very similar pattern, but they think there's going to be less damage at two days in the forecast than four days. Now, that's certainly when they think less damage, which is another misconception. We see a similar effect for this inside outside the cone where there's a steep drop off in damage habits to correspond with points being inside and outside of the cone. All right, so we'll move over to our ensemble, plot that. And this looks a little bit like a normal distribution with one standard deviation. So in some ways, what we're seeing is that people appreciate that we are more certain about where the storm will be in two days versus four days. I'd like to point out that this is very complicated, probabilistic data that varies over time and space, and people are starting to intuit it, and we're, we're getting evidence of that based on their responses. All right, so basically what we find is that when people see the cone, they see a danger zone. And when people see a visualization like on the right, they understand that there's a distribution. That brings us to our first major concept, which is that intervals create conceptual categories. When you have distributional or continuous data and you visualize it with an interval, people no longer see it as continuous or distributional. They think of it as a, a region or a, a category. You might ask, why is that the case? Barbara Traversky writes it nicely in saying, framing a picture is a way of saying that what is inside the picture has a different status than what is outside of the picture. If you're someone from the general public or really all of us, the way that you experience things in the world is if you see a boundary or a delineation, it is intended to tell you something important. The picture's here, the wall is here, here's the fence, et cetera. So you have experienced the meaning of these delineations. But when we look at our hurricane cone of uncertainty here, this is a 66% confidence interval. So is that a meaningful delineation? Well, if you live here where that little dot is placed, you might think this delineation is meaningful, therefore I am safe and areas just inside are in danger. But if we change that delineation to be like a 95% confidence interval, all of a sudden you would be encompassed by the interval. So the location of the exact boundary is set by the visualization designer. So it's not inherently as meaningful as other types of delineations we experience. So bringing to us to our second major concept, which has to do with these different rules or conventions. We've just talked about in the world, when we see a boundary, the rules or conventions are that it conveys important delineations. When we see maps, there are additional conventions that are associated with those. A map like this, for example, there is a correspondence between pixel width and some type of distance in the real world. For example, you might have a scale and you can literally measure areas on the map and do a calculation about the physical distance in the world. So there is a direct mapping between physical width on a map and physical width in the world. If we look at something like the cone of uncertainty, it starts breaking all of these conventions. The boundaries are set by the designers, so they're not necessarily hard delineations. And pixel distance of that cone does not mean <laughs> distance on a map. 
it means increased uncertainty. So we are having to suppress a lifetime of Mapios and reimagine physical width as something abstract like uncertainty. And that is very, very challenging. Our second point is that conventions cause uh, convention misalignments cause errors. And before I move on, I, I just want to point out that when we're looking at these um, visualization techniques, and we've tested a, a wide range of them, one of the types of conventions that really plays um, a big role in this is when you're showing these cones growing in size because they're literally taking up more room, people think that the storm is growing in size. And that also holds for this version of the cone that has blurry boundaries. When we first conducted this work, we really thought that the blurry boundary version would be the ideal visualization technique. But we later found that in fact leads people to think that the storm is growing in size. And we've also done studies where we've trained people to understand that these do not show the storm growing in size, but they still make their judgments as if that were the case. So it's very, very hard to override. The other major thing that I want to point out and why it's important to do testing with these visualizations is that, of course, we found this, this boundary effect with the cone, and we didn't think we would for this blurry cone on the side. But I, I'd like you to look closely at the screen and see if you can actually see banding happening here. This is a perfect gradient, but on different displays, you start to see this banding happening in the gradient, and it doesn't look continuous. I drew it in here based on what it looks like on my monitor. And so when people are actually using this, they treat it like the cone of uncertainty with these kind of bands or boundaries, and not as a smooth gradient. So they still have this categorical perception. And that happens differently across different displays based on, on your resolution and so forth. Okay, our most um, up-to-date version of communication is this ensemble visualization on the right. And part of what we're trying to do here is try to disentangle these properties that people assume are in the visualization. But what we can show on the version on the right is the path of the storm with the lines. And we can also show the category of the storm and the uncertainty in that with the color. And we can draw a circle on top to show the size of the storm. By doing this, we're trying to be very clear about the different elements that people tend to combine in their mind when they're seeing something like the cone of uncertainty. Just to summarize, we've learned today that intervals create conceptual categories, and also that convention misalignments cause errors. With that, I'd like to thank all my many collaborators and funders, and here's some resources if you want to learn more about these techniques. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lacey. Jessica. Oh, sure. So uh, thanks for having me. Um, I'll wait a moment for my slides. And we'll move to questions after Jessica's presentation. Turn it on. Push a button in front of you. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so yeah, thanks for having me. I think I'm gonna maybe further problematize or describe some more challenges um, building on what Lace has gone through. I am the Jeannie Rometty Associate Professor of Computer Science at Northwestern University. Um, and so, yeah, I think at this point in the workshop, it's probably clear that simply communicating probabilistic information is not enough. It really matters how you do it. Um, and we see several different types of sort of broad challenges um, that we can talk about as both bi bias and variance. So on the one hand, many expressions like text uh, descriptions, like highly likely, it's very probable, lead to high variance across people in interpretations. And uh, we also see, you know, problems where representations like the cone of uncertainty lead to certain biases, like these uh, categorical errors Lace described, which we could also call deterministic construal errors, where people see probability and they try to turn it into something deterministic, like storm size. Um, and so I think before I talk about other techniques that work, it's worth just stopping and noting that the reason that uncertainty visualization and communication are hard is not just a problem of like a lack of good ways to express it. It's really a problem with probability. So probability, depending on your statistical philosophy, is either a hypothetical long range frequency or a degree of belief conditioned on certain information. And in both cases, people really struggle because any event that we describe with probability is either going to realize or it's not. 
And so we're asking people to think about something very abstract and hypothetical. And so many of the strategies that work are about making probability information concrete in some way. Uh, back in the 1980s, a cognitive psychologist, Gerd Geigerenzer, uh, started to do work on framing probability as frequency. So rather than saying something like 30%, let's say three out of 10 times this event will occur. And he found that when people were asked to do classic Bayesian reasoning tasks, like reasoning about the probability that one actually had a disease given a positive test result, they tended to do better just with this simple trick of giving them the frequency instead. A lot of my work has looked at how do we take typical visual representations of distribution, things uh, like these density plots on the bottom left here, or uh, other types of uh, statistical constructs like confidence intervals that we might express with error bars and provide a visual frequency framing. So on the right here, we're just seeing a frequency-based representation of a probability distribution function we call a quantile dot plot. And the idea is that when you give people this metaphor that probability is actually just the frequency a number of times out of some base number of times that we expect something to happen, um, we see better judgments and decisions under uncertainty and experiments, um, better Bayesian reasoning. Uh, and so, so there's benefits of making it concrete through frequency. Um, as Lace already discussed, these sort of ensemble displays that she was presenting um, are one way to make the, the probability more concrete here in the tracks. Um, and so, you know, this works in a hurricane context as well. Uh, but uh, one of the themes of my talk today is going to be that even when we try very hard to make things concrete, we can still see these various errors. And so in some of Lace's uh, work that she didn't quite get a chance to discuss, they asked people to provide damage ratings at several locations giving the, given these ensemble visualizations. And so the two locations, A and B, people had to provide a damage rating. On the left, 98% of the people in this study said that uh, location B would get more damage than A. And that is correct. Um, B is closer to the, the storm center um, or the, the mass of the distribution. However, 36% of people said on the right that A would get more damage, uh, and that is not correct. So again, B here is closer um, to the center, um, but you'll notice if you look carefully, A is actually intersecting one of these little ensemble lines. And so people, even though you know they've done a lot to get over this, you know, size um, uncertainty as size, you know, misinterpretation. Um, people are still doing what we would call this deterministic construal error. They're taking a representation of probability and turning it into something that is concrete. Um, in this case, you know, whether you fall on one of these lines is thought to matter. Whoops. Um, and so, uh, you know, the types of categorical errors or deterministic construal error that Lace discussed is where we're interpreting, you know, probability as some attribute, usually of the storm, its location, its size. Another type of very common kind of heuristic or shortcut that I've seen all the time in my many years of research on uncertainty visualization is something the economist uh, Chuck Mansky calls as if optimization. And the idea is that, you know, people want to use a point estimate, something like an average, uh, in order to make some decision under uncertainty that we really shouldn't make using a single point. Uh, there's this famous quote attributed to Lyndon B. Johnson, where when he was shown an interval forecast by an economist on his team, he said, ranges are for cattle, give me a number. And this is extremely pervasive. And often people don't know uh, that they are implicitly suppressing uncertainty in favor of a point estimate. And that's what makes this so challenging to design for. Um, so in a hurricane context, you know, whenever we're giving a probability, we should expect people to try to turn it into something certain. So, you know, in a case like where we're trying to give someone the probability that their home might flood, say it's 22% in my county, uh, you know, no one knows, or not no one, but most people don't know what to do with 22%. Again, this is a hypothetical quantity. And so, you know, it's very common in this kind of uh, setting for someone to think, well, this is pretty far below 50%. Therefore, I'm just going to assume I'm good. Um, and so we see, you know, rounding as one expression of as if optimization. We're making something uh, a concrete single number that we can deal with. In a visualization context, a corollary of this is that the extent to which a visualization of distribution makes it possible to just focus on a single point estimate like the mean usually predicts how much people are going to suppress uncertainty and make, you know, non-optimal judgments or decisions. So um, you can ignore the... Um, 
sorry, the uh, annotation that should not be there. Um, but here we just have means with confidence intervals. You know, this is a very typical representation if we just have, you know, 2D uh, uh, distributional information. And it's very easy to just ignore the uncertainty because it's a separate mark. We can just look at the mean. However, what's less appreciated is that many, you know, more expressive representations of distribution, things like density plots, or even these frequency-based um, displays, it's still implicitly, you know, visible what the central tendency is. And so what we see that people, I think, don't predict is that even when you're not giving someone a point estimate specifically, many users will still kind of focus on the point estimate. So with a normal distribution, I can see where the center is, the mode, which is also the mean. Um, and so people will suppress uncertainty. So how could we design, you know, displays that really make this hard to do? Um, some of my earlier work looked at probabilistic animation, uh, where we call this hypothetical outcome plots. We're actually going to take draws from the joint distribution we want to display here, um, and we're just going to visualize those as frames in an animation. And so now, if I were to ask you, what's the mean uh, location of the red bar? What's the mean location of the blue bar? It should feel harder. Um, and, you know, there's many ways, uh, reasons to think that this kind of animated display, while it looks visually complex, is actually, you know, something that people could use to kind of uh, intuit, um, you know, information uh, about probability. So um, temporal frequency people in vision science have found is is something that people can uh, get probability information kind of implicitly from. Um, it's sort of visceral and becomes intuitive in a way that often static representations are not. Um, we can also apply this to any type of visualization, as long as we're not already using motion or animation. So here, these are rainfall plots, um, and I'm just taking draws again from the underlying uh, distribution, here a posterior distribution of my model, and uh, animating that. However, um, again, I want to problematize thing and, and talk about how hard it is to, to really fix some of these errors. Um, what we found um, when we started studying, you know, how well do these types of plots help people suppress uncertainty, uh, was that depending on the conditions in which someone is using a display, even when you try very hard to, to force them to actually integrate the uncertainty into a judgment, uh, it can still backfail or, or backfire. So in one study, we, we thought that if we added means, these lines on the bottom, um, explicitly, then people would probably uh, do much worse because suddenly they would have this point estimate. And if we ask them, you know, what's the probability that the red bar is going to be, or the red value is higher than the blue value, suddenly they would, they would ignore the uncertainty in that judgment. What we found was actually uh, the types of effect size judgments and decisions people made were virtually indistinguishable. And this was puzzling to us because we thought we were doing everything possible to prevent them from just, you know, focusing on the means. Um, and I should note that when people, you know, were asked, you know, what's the probability that the, the red bar is greater or the red value is greater than the blue value, um, often what they were doing when they, when they see means is they're looking at the visual distance between central tendency and then just mapping that to a probability judgment. And so they're, they're basically using a heuristic or a shortcut. Like I said, though, we found that people were, were answering very similarly, even when we suppressed the point estimate. And what ended up, we ended up finding out by looking at how they reported using these plots was that even though, you know, we were intentionally trying to, to force them to contend with uncertainty, many people were, were looking at the red line jumping around, which, you know, represented the score of one team in this, in this fantasy game that we had them play, looking at the location of the blue trying to estimate the mean of each of those and then comparing the visual distance between means. And so basically people are doing exactly what we tried to thwart. Um, and so the the point of this, even if you didn't follow all the details, is just that no matter how hard you try to design something that will really you know, force people to internalize uncertainty, it can be incredibly hard because these heuristics, these tendencies to suppress uncertainty are so pervasive. We do know from some of my own research and other research that this kind of suppression of uncertainty is more likely under high cognitive load when people you know, already have a lot of information, they're anxious uh, under low graphical or statistical literacy, um, as well as under motivated reasoning, which you can think of as sort of, you know, in situations where people want a simple answer and they want a particular type of simple answer. This is where, you know, we have to be most concerned and really uh, careful um, that we're giving displays that don't support this kind of just suppression of uncertainty. So one implication of this is that, you know, people do come to forecasts with different situations, with different levels of experience. And so we want to provide information at different levels of granularity um, to, you know, serve people with different needs. 
Um, but at the same time, we want to anticipate that at every level, no matter how much we aggregate the information or how detailed we give it, people are going to be trying to just turn that into something more certain. Um, and so I think we can learn a lesson here from election forecast displays. So in many ways, when people go to an election forecast, uh, you know, something like provided by these news organizations, they want a simple answer. They want to know, you know, should I be worried about this election? Uh, you know, do I need to really, you know, be concerned about voting, et cetera? And I think that's similar to when people go to a hurricane forecast. They want a simple answer that's going to help them make a decision like, should I evacuate? Um, and so in 2016, if you looked at 538's election forecast, top level display when you first load the page, they gave people two probabilities of each candidate winning. Um, and what you'll notice that it's very easy, you know, if you don't want to grapple with uncertainty to just round this value up. And so here, you know, I don't know what to do with 71.4%, but I, it seems pretty far above 50%. So I might, you know, just assume, oh yeah, you know, Clinton is going to win this election. You know, four years later, I think they learned some major lessons about how likely people are to just suppress this. And so the top level forecast, you get no probability, you get no point estimate at all. You have to contend with the uncertainty. You know, we have to sort of look at how many, you know, plots are there and make a judgment, a visual judgment. And so this, this type of approach using frequency to try to get people to internalize things is still our best bet, but, uh, but of course it can, like I said, backfail or backfire. Um, you know, some other work that LACE did not get a chance to present is also relevant here. So another implication of as-if optimization is that even when you give people more detailed probability information, um, they might end up using it in such a way that their judgments are very similar to if you had really aggregated or summarized that information. So here we're seeing um, two different depictions of uncertainty in location um, uh, about, uh, you know, in a hurricane on the left, it's a 66% interval. On the right, we're also seeing size because uh, they, they're showing these splats, which are both information about the location and the size predicted by the model. Um, the actual plots were animated, um, so they both did show uh, size information. Um, the one on the left would, would animate over time. Um, but the point was that the judgments of damage were very similar between these two plots, even though one is much more detailed. Um, often when we design displays, we do have to summarize to some extent, you know, we can't give full, you know, continuous probability. Um, and, and here, you know, in this study, when they, when they give these three different intervals, the judgments were more different from either of the other two displays. It's all about really finding the right level of aggregation and testing it with your users, um, which I think has been mentioned already by Wendy. Um, so, you know, in this display in the middle, uh, you know, we're still not getting uncertainty. So if we ran the model with different initial conditions, for instance, the projected location uh, and the and the uncertainty in the projected location would change. And so here we might want to show people not just, you know, a single representation, but show them multiple possible scenarios. And so this is my final point that often, you know, we don't just want a single map. We want to show people, you know, several different scenarios with a narrative that's in simple language that can help them understand, like, these are all things that can happen. Um, and so, you know, one kind of, you know, uh, approach I like is just this simple strategy of let's show people a couple, you know, representations, visualizations of scenarios that would not surprise us. So things that we would expect to see a lot that are from sort of the center of our, you know, posterior distribution from our model. Um, then we can show some things that we, you know, might see sometimes or that would surprise us a little, as well as things that we are, we don't think are very likely, but if they happened would have detrimental sort of consequences. So, um, and we can play with things like visual emphasis. So how big do you make these different scenarios in terms of, you know, each scenario is kind of a visualization, how much visual weight do you give them um, can really affect how much weight or how much, you know, probability people then assign to that. So again, it takes experimentation and it takes testing with the people that are gonna actually be using this. Um, so yeah, I will stop there. Um, and happy to take questions. Great. Thank you, Jessica. Sure. So um, we've run a little over, um, but we have uh, two things that we wanted to do to conclude this section. First is to um, introduce a prototype and have each of our, uh, our speakers talk about their prototype a little. So we're going to cut that a little short because so we've run sorry. over mm -hmm. and because we'd like to save time for at least a couple of uh, questions. And Andrew, would you mind moderating the questions after the prototype thing? Sure. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, so 
We've heard a lot about uh, risk communication, especially graphical risk communication from our experts. And um, a lot of this is based on theory and a, a lot of experimentation. Um, I, in my former life, uh, was a person who made some of uh, some of these graphics that go out. <laughs> I will take full blame for this. So what we thought might be an instructive few minutes here would be to take our experts and ask them to be take some of this theory they've just discussed and apply it to a very, very young, very, very naively built uh, product that's supposed to express the um, uncertainty of receiving certain hurricane force winds. So um, I don't know if we have the, did, am I sharing the graphic? Oh, sorry. Oh, I had sent it. I can hear it. Okay, hey, I thought it was in the stack too. <laughs> so, um, so while Andrea is pulling that up, do we have any burning questions from the uh, audience? Yes, yes. Well, surprisingly easy. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, Cassandra Shivers Williams. I'm from NOAA's weather program office, and I'm wondering if either of you have insight into how we might be able to either combat the heuristics people use when they're looking at these displays and trying to make decisions, or maybe redirect them or re-emphasize them in a certain way, right? Like maybe their baseline needs to be re-anchored somehow, or like how can we help people, I guess, interpret differently? Because we know that people use heuristics with decision-making, especially like you talked about with high cognitive load and things like that. We can't really fix that in some way. So I'm wondering if you guys have thoughts on that. Yeah, I guess I can start. Um, I mean, I think it's hard. I was trying to sort of make clear that, you're, you know, it's never, it's never easy, um, but I do think the frequency framing works well. And so you know, rather than just giving what someone a single graphical representation that includes the probability, show them multiple scenarios or multiple, you know, draws from that same probability distribution separately. Um, and so you can do that using animation and stitch them together, or you can just show static, what we would call small multiples, which in visualization, which is like a set of static stills that show, you know, slightly different information. And so each one corresponds to, you know, some point in the distribution you're trying to convey. Um, I think that's, you know, still going to be one of your best bets because people then don't have to in interpret things like these visual cues, like how fuzzy something looks on the map or the size of it as probability. They can just see that like, oh, this happens and this can happen and this can happen and this can happen. And that makes it much more concrete. So, I, um, you know, I still think that's one of the best um, approaches. And yeah, as Lace discussed, you can apply this in a single display as well. It doesn't have to be separate little maps um, like her ensemble plot. Um, Lace? Yeah, I agree with that. I, and I think that, I think expecting people to do anything different or be trained or have, you know, more exposure to something is just generally a ten technique that can, is just fraught with failure in, in my experience. Even when we try to train people, um, what happens is the visual information guides their decision. So if you want people to um, in some ways respond differently, you have to change the visual information rather than adding an annotation, for example. And I think Jessica had really good examples of of ways to potentially change the visual information to help people come to a better conclusion. Thank you both. And I'd just like to add that Sarah Coote has done some, um, some research showing that the type of information that the way you present the information may be different for different kinds of decisions and may be more effective depending on the type of decision they're facing. So it's, there's not a one size fit, fits all answer for this. So thank you all very much. And I'll move it over to Andrea. All right, so sorry for the technical delay. Um, so for this exercise, I'm going to show this prototype product. Um, just to note, this is not an official hurricane product. This is not even close at this point. This is a product that has been paid for through research and development um, created by atmospheric scientists. 
And um, the point here is that maybe this isn't the time period when we would expect to necessarily start bringing in social science ideas, but a lot of these products some of these initial design decisions sometimes get momentum. And we get to the point where we create this great product. It takes us years of development. We get it into operations, which means putting it on machines. And then we do the social science research. And it's seen that the social science is holding us back from releasing this great product. Or we release it, and then we have to change it later. So the whole idea here is maybe it's time to start looking at these earlier products and and you know, maybe it's time for these different academic communities to actually start understanding each other so we can make better design choices sooner um, and not create this propagating um, issue. So here are two versions of a graphic that is meant to express the maximum wind speed exceedance values for the next five days. I know that the title itself is probably something we could talk about for 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> there are two graphics here. One represents the most likely wind speeds uh, that people will see. And the second graphic represents what we call a reasonable worst case scenario, another term I think we could probably talk about for 20 minutes. Um, and we asked um, our, our speakers to please give us some impressions. What would theory tell us that we really need to work on here right away? How can we improve this product now? before we send it along. So have at it. I mean, Lace, do you want to start? Sure. I think something to, to think about for the general public is they will focus on the visuals and they will ignore or maybe not even be able to understand the text. Um, so if you have a situation where them thoroughly understanding the, the textual um, annotations, that, that will be very challenging. So in my interpretation of this, I think people will look at the visuals and very similar to the cone of uncertainty that doesn't show any um, you know, uh, intensity or size, it just shows the track, they see it as impact area. So I think people will look at this and see impact area, even though, and, and maybe that is not that wrong for this, given that you're trying to show wind speed. But I think that would be the misconception I would think that they might come to for this. Um, and then of course, going to the categorical perception where they're they're gonna look at the areas that are in the brightest red and say, okay, well, if I'm not there, then maybe I'm okay. Um, that's kind of my first impulse of what, of what might happen. One thing I will note is this is actually impact area. So, but it's ah, very well, constructive to understand how this could be misconstrued due to the fact that the cone of uncertainty is so ingrained in people's minds. They may not actually see this as, what, right. what it is. <laughs> right. So, so thinking about that, you know, you're, you're communicating, um, wind force speeds, right. And that is kind of hard to map onto someone's personal experience. One way to communicate the same information, but maybe in more plain language would be what is the impact to them? Maybe it's that, um, areas that are in the light yellow are at low risk or maybe, infrastructures that are unstable might be uh, dangerous, but areas under the red, <laughs> um, you know, major hurricane force winds, any type of structure might be at risk. So instead of having the technical terms here, I'm hearkening back to <laughs> Wendy's talk, it could be useful to remap the, the categories to people's individual experiences. So they have an understanding of of what their response should be in relationship to this. Great. I would add, um, you know, you have like two different scenarios, say, and, you know, people will probably interpret the bounds on those, you know, um, different wind categories. Uh, mm -hmm. They'll put place too much weight on exactly these two scenarios. And so you want them to know that there's some uncertainty, you know, are you in the hurricane force wind or not is, you know, like it's not exactly this line. And so I would probably use something like I suggested at the end of my talk, where you show people a few more scenarios that are highly likely. So I think we have on the left, like the maximum likelihood estimate, which itself only has a little bit of, you know, probability assigned to it. So I would probably draw from like the center, like 50% uh, of the of the density of the po uh, posterior distribution of your model and, um, and say, you know, narrate it as, you know, these are, these are all different scenarios that would not surprise us, something like that. And then you know, you could still have the worst case. Um, you like right now, I think you're sort of implying people should put equal weight on these two scenarios when in reality, things like the one on the left are going to be way more likely. Yep. If 
I mean, maybe that's because, you know, people will underweight the very risky, but low probability event. So anyway, de de depending on what, you know, how much weight you want them to give each, you could, you know, have multiples, you know, examples that are similar on the left of like things that we think are likely, um, and then have a much bigger sized one of the, the detrimental, like a, mm -hmm. that's where I would sort of play with the okay. effect you want to have. Um, well, excellent. Um, we're fortunately out of time, but okay. <laughs> this is something that I'm sure we could have spent a lot of time. And I think this really emphasizes how co-development is so important here. Um, just letting atmospheric scientists develop one thing and then kick it over to social scientists for feedback after we've kind of already set our minds up on certain things is not the best way to go about. So I really appreciate your expertise and just, I know you could immediately find something wrong there. So <laughs> no, I think it's a good start. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Lacey. Okay, we are at the last panel of speakers for the workshop. And um, one of our speakers unfortunately cannot be here because he is briefing the California governor about what's happening in California. However, we do have two excellent speakers who will be presenting to us today about access and functional needs related issues and communicating risk. We're going to start with Joseph Trujillo Falcon, who will be speaking to us about Spanish related risk communication issues and possibly other things. And this will be followed by Sherman Gillens, who is with FEMA's Office of OIDC. I apologize. I cannot remember exactly what that is. ODIC, <laughs> Office of Disability Integration. Oh, all right. Thank you very much. And uh, you do have a little bit more time because we have one speaker who's not here. <laughs> well, wonderful. Thank you so much. And good afternoon, everybody. It's such an honor to be part of such an amazing group of panelists and speakers. And honestly, I'm very humbled to be able to uplift the perspectives of two groups that I believe aren't often talked about enough when it comes to tropical cyclones. And those are multilingual populations and immigrant populations. The National Weather Service has linked fatalities to language inequities all the way back to 1970. Nearly a half a century later, we have yet to develop a thorough way of communicating emergencies in other languages. The fact that we continue to have a monolingual emergency communication system does limit a lot of individuals from really understanding and engaging in the information to make proper decisions. A lot of my work has actually been inspired by these communities themselves. Before I ever conducted any sort of social science research in this area, my first job was a bilingual meteorologist uh, for a radio station in the local Bryan and College Station, Texas area. And little did I know that my first major weather event would be two weeks into my first my career, and it would be Hurricane Harvey. It was an eye-opening moment. I was the only Spanish speaker in that area that was able to provide that given information. I got to witness the firsthand accounts of individuals and really got to see these language vulnerabilities firsthand. I wanted to kick off today's presentation with more of a personal narrative and tie in some social science research to really illustrate the disparities that exist and continue to happen present day. I want to start off by a, a comment made by a viewer, Manuela Cruz, in the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey. Her, among the entire Bryan College Station, Texas community, were extremely confused about this event. Different media outlets were communicating different things in a language that she was not familiar with. And she expressed that if it was not for this information in Spanish, she would have not been able to engage in it and eventually to take, take protective action. I can name a ton of tropical cyclones where this continues to happen. Hurricane Ian, Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Irma, the list goes on and on and on. You continue to see news cycles where language inequities contribute to people not understanding and engaging in information. And in present day, we're trying to continue to increase those efforts and reach these communities, but it was of utmost important during this event where I got to personally experience it and see it for myself, that when you do provide information in someone's dominant language, they are able to engage in that information. But here's the thing. 
when it comes to even the most principal and even the most foundational definitions in risk communication language, we come to see that you can look at whatever agency, whether it be the National Weather Service, FEMA, or the World Meteorological Organization. The fact that as of right now, we cannot yet agree on a defined definition for hurricane watch and warning tells you that entire story. Whenever we go about translating something from English to Spanish, messages can get lost in translation. And the lack of an official English to Spanish dictionary here in the United States for weather, climate, and risk terminology inhibits us from creating that consistent terminology going forward. I've published a lot of this un uh, under this area uh, within the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society with tornado hazards, but it really does apply to hurricane hazards as well. Whenever we go about translating something from English to Spanish, we, you know, there are different variations, regional varieties, dialects of our language that could really get in the way of understanding. And so say I'm from Peru, I can talk a little bit differently as somebody from Puerto Rico or Paraguay does. And that is very, very important. And our language is beautiful and diverse, and it should stay that way. But when it comes to emergency messaging, when we translate something from English to Spanish, we may do it in our own best capacity, which may not resonate with everyone in that given community. One of my favorite examples is actually the word rip current, uh, because in Spanish, the translation of it uh, for the Puerto Ricans is the word resaca. And so the weather service was issuing uh, avisos de resacas, uh, rip current warnings for the coast. But yeah, that may mean rip current for a few people, but for the rest of Latin America, a resaca actually means hangover. So they were quite literally issuing hangover warnings for the coast, which technically correct, but I mean, wrong hazard. But that's the fact of the issue here. The fact that we can't consistently communicate in someone's language and aren't able to portray that risk. Messages get lost in translation all the time and we have to make sure that we go about doing it. And so whenever we go about approaching this sort of work and real, and when someone comes up to me about, okay, well, how important could this really be? I want to be able to actually give you a big number here. 69 million individuals speak a language other than English here at home in the United States as of, as of the most recent Census Bureau data. That is one in five Americans already present day. By 2060, there are reports out there that estimate that nearly one in four Americans will see speak, speak Spanish at home, for example. This number continues to grow in size and proportion. And it's not a matter of if, but when this becomes more consequ consequential in our emergency communication systems going on into the future. And so topic number one, of course, is that language inaccessibility. I highlighted a lot of examples here in Spanish, but it could be applicable to all the other non-English uh, languages spoken here in the United States. The second a theme that I really wanted to emphasize a little bit upon and something that we don't often bring into the conversations of tropical cyclones is the conversation of immigrant populations and it's particularly undocumented communities. A U.S. Customs and Enforcement have this thing called the 100 mile border zone where their jurisdiction lies 100 miles between any sort of land or sea border. And that involves nearly two of three people here in the United States. They're able to open up, uh, for example, checkpoints along the border so that they can make sure that people are U.S. citizens. They can also be able to search people without a warrant in these given areas that are highlighted in red there. Of course, uh, you could see how this can become an issue when it comes to hurricane evacuations. When people are trying to leave the coast, there are undocumented immigrants within these communities that have a choice to make. Do you? evacuate uh, during this hurricane or run the risk of never seeing your children or your other family members ever again. Let's take a moment to think about that. No matter the risk messaging, no matter the condition, the fact that you might not be able to see your family again is something that really, really traumatizes these individuals and it may inhibit them from taking protective action altogether. I got to experience this firsthand as a broadcast meteorologist during Hurricane Harvey when uh, the president of the United States at that time was saying that immigration customs and enforcement would remain open during evacuation orders while local officials were communicating and saying that, no, 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 we're going to actually remain closed and make sure that everybody stays safe. This actually made the Texas Tribune and um, Lorella here from ACLU was just stating of how inconsistent the messaging was during this event. And it actually caused a lot of immigrant populations to stay back and not evacuate during this given event. It was a very eye-opening event. And you can look back at other hurricane hazards, for example, in Katrina, where you know people from immigration, customs, and enforcement would go in to try to help the community, but would end up setting, for example, in Katrina, three people to deportation proceedings in the aftermath of the rescue efforts. 
I'm a fond belief with Lorela here that everyone, no matter the color of their skin or background, is worth saving during these events. And in the most recent administration, there has been efforts to be able to lift this temporarily for the time being. You know, these checkpoints will not be open during times of evacuation so that everyone can take this decision, decision altogether. There's still a lot of work here to do, but I am a fond believer that everybody deserves a chance of safety when it comes to hurricanes and any other tropical cyclone events out there. Moving just beyond the language and the immigration standpoint of all this is the fact that we also have to make sure that languages are, or messages are tailored in such a way that it resonates with a given community. You know, like I mentioned before, I, being Peruvian, I've never experienced a hurricane before, but someone in Puerto Rico has lived it all their lives. The fact that we categorize big, broad groups like Hispanic or Latinos as one singular category can really get muddly in the way we tailor messages all together. Because if you try to teach someone from the Caribbean what a hurricane is, they might feel offended at the fact that you're trying to do that. Whereas there may be other Hispanic or Latino communities that may need it more because they've never experienced that hazard altogether. So I always like to tell my colleagues that, sure, a lot of this language research that we're conducting is a wonderful first step forward, but it should only be considered a first step forward. You can translate the message, but without the context and without the cultural variables as well, you're not able to properly contextualize it and tailor it to a given community. I wanted to end today's talk with some things that we're working within the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. I'm actually a principal investigator on a grant that supports this initiative, and we are proud to actually be able to integrate artificial intelligence and in being and in moving forward and creating language translations for not just messages in Spanish, but Vietnamese, Mandarin, among other languages as well. What we're trying to do is create a, a neural adaptive translation software with, using artificial intelligence to where uh, they have access to a National Weather Service domain. And of course, language translators, certified language translators that understand the different dialects of the language are brought in, we're able to establish glossaries and definitive terminologies. And as of right now, it has about a 98 to 99% accuracy rate after years of training. And we actually were able to use it for the first time during Hurricane Ilari to be able to translate the key messages completely into Spanish using this software. A big thing within the National Weather Service is a lot of the translations conducted within the National Hurricane Center and other areas as well are done by the San Juan office and done by voluntary translation teams within that agency. As a forecaster, you have the ability to not just uh, be able to forecast, but now you also have a lot of responsibilities in translation. It's a lot of work, and we're trying to reduce that, uh, that workload for these individuals so that they can at least have some automated translations and they can just review a couple of terms. But we've found great success in this area to not only communicate key messages, but also be able to translate information into other languages like for here, Vietnamese, and also contextualize the cultural component as well so that we're able to bring people from step one and say, this is what a hurricane hazard is. This is what you need to do uh, something. Uh, uh, these are the recommendations that are involved in this. And let's break it down from the very first step and go all the way going forward. Uh, as a PI on this grant, we're actually creating uh, software within GIS to be able to locate where multilingual communities are uh, in the United States so that we can find these populations, tailor it, find community organizations and be able to work with them in the future. I invite you to scan this QR code. It, it's actually a glimpse as to what the weather service can and will look like in the future, weather.gov slash translate. You'll be able to get a first glimpse at some of the tools that we have been working on to be able to provide language accessibility. Because ladies and gentlemen, it's been nearly half a century. We have not made tailored solutions and we'll continue to work to make sure that we can create a weather ready nation for all. Thank you so much. I need to go backwards to my slides here. Can we tee up the slides? Okay. Am I controlling them with this? I think that Hugh's going to get it going in the back. Okay. While he's doing that, I'll just uh, first of all say hello to everybody. Um, Around this time last year, I was, uh, I think I was in Selma, Alabama after a, I think an EF2 or three tornado had just touched down and wreaked havoc on, on one of the communities uh, in the Selma area. And I finished the year 2022 in uh, Clarksville, Tennessee, where another set of tornadoes touched down and wreaked havoc in, that, in those communities. Uh, it turned out to be a pretty busy year for us. I think it was probably a record year for billion dollar disasters. Uh, 2023 and 
if there's one thing I take away every time I go to these places is that um, you learn the most by talking to people, especially when you're talking about communication and what resonated by finding out what didn't work. Um, I find that in most cases, it's not the message. It's really about this way that people try to see circumstances in a light most favorable to them and their circumstances and how they process it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that through the lens of disability integration. Um, because while we know that there are people with disabilities in society, uh, it's been my experience that they're often invisibilized during disasters because they either don't appear, they can't get to places like shelters and disaster recovery centers. Um, and a lot of times they weren't considered in the planning. And I think that becomes most acute in the uh, the way we communicate with the public, whenever we uh, uh, warn them about what's to come. So we'll go to the next slide. I became FEMA's fourth disability coordinator in August of 2022. Um, the, the, the law that established it was the Post-Katrina Emergency Management Reform Act. And I bring that up because uh, there's a bit of serendipity at play where this law in my experience is concerned, um, what's not apparent there is I was, I'm in a wheelchair right now, in case you didn't see me come in, um, I was injured while serving in the Marine Corps and I spent a great deal of time in the San Diego area uh, as a person who had just joined the 61 million club, the 61 million people in the United States who either identify or are regarded as disabled. Um, that's important because I processed what was before my injury, a little disaster experience I really didn't know I had or didn't realize I had. When I was in the Marine Corps, we responded to Hurricane Floyd, evacuated Paris Island and did some work around that. So I had a little bit of experience. I happen to have the platoon of all the recruits who were injured, uh, 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 medical rehab platoon. So I had to move about 112 uh, uh, recruits about you know 100 miles south into, into Georgia. And that was an experience. Um, I also was in Japan when the Kobe earthquake happened. This is where the beef, Kobe beef comes from, but there was a big earthquake there. And uh, and I also did some work with Harvey and Maria before I even thought about coming to FEMA. Um, and the point is, disasters touch a lot of lives in ways people don't realize. And a lot of times they try to forget about it. Um, and what that means is they don't learn from it. They don't learn from what happened. And a lot of times if they're lucky, they kind of see that as their reality going forward. And that's unfortunate because... Um, and as I'll talk about later, unfortunately, people do die um, even after having experienced disasters because they make the wrong decision. Um, and I said, as I said before, that, you know, this this whole idea of seeing the disaster or the circumstance in a light most favorable to one's circumstances, it's not theoretical for me. Um, next slide, please. I heard the uh, previous speaker talk about um, uncertainty suppression. I took no, I took note of that, Ms. Holman, because uh, that's an interesting way to uh, sum up what happens in these moments. And I'll talk about this picture, which is from Hurricane Katrina, and what that had to do with my experience almost 20 years later. Hurricane Katrina happened in um, August of 2005. And like most of you probably, we watched images of people at the, at the football stadium um, I don't know that they focus so much on disability, but uh, but the reality was if you were disabled or uh, of advanced age, you were more likely to die in Hurricane Katrina than most other survivor populations. Now, as a person who was newly disabled, this was in 2005, I'd just gotten out of the Marine Corps three years prior to that, I saw all this. And uh, I wasn't attached to it, but I did note that, wow, if I was there, I'd be in pretty bad shape. And again, this was in August of 2005. Um, anybody from San Diego? You, you remember what happened around Labor Day weekend in 2005? We'll click, the, click the next one. Another image is going to come up. There were wildfires. This was just a month after I'd seen all these people sitting outside the stadium. Saying to myself, boy, I'd be in a bad situation. If that were me. So when I woke up on that, I think it was Monday morning, and heard about wildfires that were up in the LA area, 
I thought, wow, that's not good. That's that sounds pretty bad for those families up there. You know, I wonder what they're going to do. I, I can't imagine losing everything. I went about my day a little bit and um, went back to the television. And I think I saw maybe a crawl that talked about the fact that the fires were moving closer. And I lived in Rancho Penasquitas at the time. And if you know anything about wildfires, they, they move pretty fast. There's there's not a lot of warning. But in this case, uh, I could I could see the sky getting red and I could taste the soot in the air. And by the time, you know, the warnings were coming across the crawl on the television saying um, this is the time to evacuate. If you're in the area I was in, uh, Qualcomm Stadium, which is where the San Diego Chargers play, was the site that they advised us to go to. And the first thing I thought about was that picture. I'm not going there. I am not going to put myself. No, Now, mind you. There's a fire bearing down. And in that moment, that that sort of that that window of uncertainty suppression, I'm making a calculation. Now, I'm a fairly educated guy. I graduated from the University of San Diego. I think I'm pretty smart. But in that moment, it became less about what was most safe and more about what was most certain for me. I wasn't safe either way, I felt. But what's more certain is that if I stay in my home and nothing happens, I'm better off than if I go to that football stadium and they don't let me leave and I can't come back. And even if I lose everything, I'll get out in time. How, how fast can a fire come? Um, and, it, and it wasn't until uh, it was basically it had jumped the freeway, I-15. And uh, if, you don't, if you know how San Diego set up the Miramar base, there's a lot of open land. And it just gained steam and began to burn everywhere and kind of surrounded the neighborhood. If you can see that picture. And I thought in that moment, I made a bad decision. Uh, however, I'm still not in that stadium where after having been to a couple of games, I know it would have been worse. Because it wasn't about whether I'd be burned alive. It was about whether they would understand my needs. I use catheters to answer the call of nature. They're not going to understand that. I can't lay on a cot because I'll get decubitus ulcers. I'm, I'm rationalizing in my mind through the window of uncertainty that I'm in, what's going to be more certain for my safety? Um, now, ultimately, they put the fire out. Uh, fortunately, the area where I lived in didn't incur damage. But I bring that experience into this role as a disability coordinator and think about why do people make those decisions? Part of it is, well, I understand it. I, I, you know, I get it. But in that situation, I have to say, I didn't have a lot of time to think. The work we're talking about here is when you when people have time to think, when you see that that storm system moving, what's going through the individual's mind who lives with a disability, whose home is his or her sanctuary or their sanctuary, and you're now asking them to leave that sanctuary and go into in a, 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 uh, an instance where the uncertainty is profound to a point where it could have uh, per, per permanent implications. Next slide, please. I think I heard um, Dr. Sutton at a, I can't remember what event was, and, I, and she talked about messaging and the importance of it. And until I saw this graphic, and this is sort of an adaptation of a graphic that Dr. Dennis Maletti, you probably all know who he is, um, God rest his soul. And he talked about this sort of cycle or the phases of how people process. And I thought it was so interesting because I can sit here and think through every part of this that was uh instrumental in my decision-making process, starting with what I was being told. I was being told to leave my home to go to the football stadium. Okay, I know there's a fire, but how does that, you know, I can't personalize that. Because now I'm thinking about the things that are personal to me, and they're not giving me enough information. What if I get in my van and run out of gas? I mean, the freeway is packed. I'm not going to make it. Nobody's going to stop to help me. There's probably no more gas. I'm thinking of the, you know, the worst-case scenario. But those five elements of, of, of the message, um, and I'll talk about in a little bit how that going forward uh, informed the advocacy work I put in now, but not going through those steps, not telling me who's telling me this, right? I'm, I'm, I'm listening to newscasters talk about it. I'm seeing a crawl, but I don't know who this is from, and it just didn't seem credible, right? The hazard itself, I knew what it was. There was wildfire, but I didn't know where it was. 
I didn't know how fast it was moving. All I heard was get out. All right. And so a lot of this is being processed again in a light most favorable to the individual who then has to decide, am I going to put myself in a worse situation? Or at least that's the impression. The next part of it is how I got the message. Was it clear, complete, consistent, certain, or accurate? Um, I can't tell you enough. The, you know, it, when I was asked to come to this to speak at this, I thought, do most people even know what a cyclone is? Right. <laughs> or what it, or a, or a, a, a um, the cyclone and the, uh, what's the other thing? The typhoon, right? What the differences are, a hurricane, right? I'd been to Australia, so I kind of knew what a cyclone was, and I lived in Japan. But a lot of people can't process that, and I think most people take for granted that a lot of people are going to process what they're being told uh, in a lens that um, is is mindful of the actual danger when they when they have to probably go to google to figure out what is this that we're even talking about what is a what is a cyclone i remember california i think it was last year they had a cyclone they, they had a bomb cyclone like, what is that you know what i don't even, you know so we talk about it in this language of uh you know of, of, of being really specific and wanting to be clear um but clear is in the eye of the beholder so i would just that's where inclusion on the front end, inclusion at the table during planning is really important because they're going to tell you, I don't know what that is. And even at FEMA, I have to do a lot of work inside of those walls, having people understand you're not dealing with people who do this work. They may have never been in a disaster before. Don't take for granted how unclear you might be if you're not having them help you with the messaging. So that was a, an object lesson there. Um, then the most important part is that third part. How is it being perceived? Do I understand it? Do I believe it? Can I personalize it? And how does that inform the decision I'll make? And this is a cycle because as you all know, news changes fast. During Hurricane Ian, um, you know, we get about eight days where we can kind of see it. And I'm in my office with my team trying to guess. It's not a game, but we're trying to game out. What if it turns this way? What if it does this? Because what we do is we look at population data, disability population data. We look at the census. We look at um, uh, SVI index. We look at empower data. This, these are all the people that are electricity dependent. And we look at IA registrations from previous disasters to make a, we triangulate ourselves into a profile. Okay, we know this area has a lot of people who are deaf, right? Selma has a deaf school, right? There's, I mean, we look at all that information and then we try to sort of assess or diagnose what's likely to happen if it, if the wind or weather system does certain things. Um, and that hopefully guides the messaging, because then we know if you've got people who are, uh, you know, who are going to need American Sign Language, and I see the governor doing a public address with no ASL interpreter, we're in trouble. Somebody better let the state know. You need to have a sign language interpreter. You've got a lot of people you are not going to reach. People who are deaf live alone. They live independently. They function very well. You have entire communities in Puerto Rico that don't interact with society because they have their own language and it works for them. But when a disaster happens and there's information that's critical, if you don't have relationships with those communities, you had better be doing the work of figuring out where the gaps are so that people aren't getting missed um, as you're putting out the message. And then the last part is very interesting. Um, this idea of either moving or milling and milling is when you're kind of you you've processed everything and i'll use sort of the analogy because i was just in clarksville after a tornado where you've got your family and you're trying to decide do we leave or do we go and as dr maletti pointed out in one of his videos um you know it's it's been this phenomenon where if if the dad makes the decision it's typically to stay but if you appeal to the mom and there are kids they're instinct is to leave and go to a safer place. Um, and so I found it interesting. And it's probably not generalizable. You know, there are differences, but he talked about how you really have to be mindful of who we're directing information to, who are the decision makers. Now, if you're talking about people with disabilities, you're probably talking about somebody who's a caregiver, um, whose bias may be for leaving. And you may have to interact with a person with a disability and convince that person, you're going to be okay. I'll be with you. You know, all these other aspects of living that are pretty routine, uh, but during a crisis, it takes on a much different hue, you know? And so we talk about the idea of milling and in that moment, in those, you know, that 48 hours before landfall, what's happening in homes, 
who's having the discussion, who's leading the discussion, who's got information directed. This is where cultural competency, I know we talk about it at nauseum and it's sort of this virtue signaling thing. It's, it's a strategy. If you want people to move out of certain areas, you have to make them feel like the information is for them and at them, right? And I'll talk to you about how this became real in a very three-dimensional way for me. Um, next slide, please. Um, was anybody in um, Florida after Hurricane Ian? Or see any coverage on Sanibel Island? That bridge that you see is the bridge that um, the hurricane blew apart. Sanibel Island, is it's a mostly higher income area. So people have autonomy. They have resources. The problem in this case is there was a lot of uncertainty about the actual threat. And the only reason why I know this is because I talked to a woman who's blind and she was living in a trailer. And the only reason why she left is because her daughter drove 200 miles to get her out of there. She drove from up North 200 miles and said, mom, we're leaving. And I said, uh, so you were thinking about staying? I mean, like, was that even a, a choice? And she said, well, I didn't, you know, and I said, uh, well, what about, you know, do you know anybody who also thought that way and maybe didn't have somebody who came? And she said, yeah, there were a few neighbors we lost. Uh, one was a brother and sister who were in a home. Um, and, and as it got washed away, the brother was able to escape and the home went under with the sister in it. And I said, well, you know, why do you suppose they stayed? Um, did they not get the message? And she said, no, they heard everything. They heard everything I heard. I mean, we sensed the danger, um, but they didn't personalize it. We had been through this before. We had seen these before, right? You still hear that. I have friends in Florida still that you tell them, hey, be careful. They're like, ah, oh, they're going to they're gonna get soda, sit out on the porch and watch the hurricane go by. Yeah, it's just, just weird. Um, but she told me about how they heard everything. Everybody heard the same thing. And those who could leave left. Those who couldn't because of inaccessible transportation, unfortunately, that's another aspect of this that I have to uh, account for in disaster response. But FEMA doesn't come in until it's been declared. We're not there the day it happens. A lot of times the disaster starts local and end locally. So we have to have some sense that the community has been prepared in advance of these. Uh, but in this case, when the bridge went out, um, people couldn't leave. And I don't think a lot of them knew that it was going to be that bad, you know? And so the lesson there uh, had a lot to do with understanding the psychology of a, a would be survivor. It's not always clear. Some of it is very cultural. I've been to East Palestine where the train derailment happened. We're about a, a we're on the one year anniversary. Um, I went to Puerto Rico after hurricane Fiona. Um, and there's always this autonomy that people retain. And that autonomy sometimes means at their peril. And how do we break through that is the constant concern. Um, next slide, please. And I'll end. I just saw Justin leave. He's our communications director, uh, external affairs. But a lot of what was different at FEMA uh, since I got there was my deliberate decision, number one, to be more visible ahead of these storms and speak the language of the disability community. Now, it does vary, right? It's not just one language. But telling somebody to evacuate versus telling someone how to access accessible transportation so that you can evacuate, it's a different way to talk about it. And sometimes, you know, the, the bandwidth is, is there's not enough bandwidth to squeeze all that in. Right. We can't get every person who's deaf, person who's blind, person in a wheelchair. person. Well, we had better try in some way. And sometimes it's not about being on Fox weather. It's sometimes having having connections with stakeholders who have those channels all the time prior to the storm that can then deliver that information, whether we're talking about uh, centers for independent living, of course, the Red Cross is, is always a big part of it, but having community organizations in, in Selma, it was the churches, having them be a part of that and having an awareness that they're going to have to be a part of that was a, was a big important aspect of how we strategize communication, um, especially when we have these, you know, pre landfall opportunities to talk through what can happen. So, um, I think that may be the last slide. Is that the last one? Next slide, please. And so that's pretty much, um, you know, the, the expanse of how we got through 2022 and 2023.
this year. I don't know what kind of year we'll have, but I anticipate that um, I like to think that we'll be more ready. And a lot of that will entail making sure that our messaging, uh, effective messaging means that we understand what's going to resonate, uh, what's going to have people overcome that, that uncertainty paradox that they're caught in so that they make the best decision for themselves. Thank you. Oh, fantastic talks. Thank you both. Um, I'm inspired. And um, I'm going to kick off with one question and I'm going to open it up to the audience because I know you have all probably have a lot of questions. Um, this one is uh, directed to both of you, but first to Joseph. Um, are there specific words that you're learning that are difficult to translate that are jargon in particular within AI or within the disability community language sphere, things that are hard to translate? Thank you so much for that question. Yeah, no, we've been having a lot of fun with that. Just looking at these, one of my personal favorites in terms of jargon is actually the trough. Um, they It often gets translated to like trough where pigs eat. <laughs> and so the, there, there's different varieties and a lot of those challenges, actually tropical cyclones, there's been a lot of good terminologies and especially Puerto Rico and the Caribbean have experienced those hazards before. And so they have words to describe them. A lot of it has actually been a more focused on the tornado space, a flash flood space, and then in the winter weather space where it's especially in places in Latin America, they're, since they don't experience a ton of winter weather hazards, sometimes those words don't aren't able to even be defined. Like one example is we make a very heavy distinction between um, freezing rain, sleet, and snow. That distinction is not as distinguishable in Spanish just because those kind of hazards don't exist over there. So there's no need to define those things. Um, within the tropical space though, a lot of the things do relate to the risk terminology just because even the word warning as I exemplified, isn't there's not a direct translation for it. There's about six different variations of it. And depending on where you're from, you can contextualize it very differently. And so we have been learning a lot through this space uh, of looking at these sorts of um, varieties, but really the importance of integrating linguistic experts in this conversation. You know, I'm a social scientist. I can conduct communication research on how these people perceive these words, but I'm a fond believer that, you know, we need to bring certified translators into the table that understand these dialectical varieties and know how to communicate it forward. And so really bringing them into this conversation would be very valuable going forward. Yeah, I think, uh, Dr. Sutton, you might have talked about one recently, uh, this notion of lake effect snow. I'm from Buffalo, New York. And when the storm happened last year, um, I, I grew up with lake effect snow. I was five years old in a blizzard of 77, you know, and I know what it's like to wake up and the snow is high, as high as your house. You know, that's when I made all the money as a kid, you know, digging people out and all that stuff. But when, you know, but again, if somebody's from out of town or if somebody is, is new to the area, that doesn't mean a whole lot. What does lake effect snow mean? Well, you know, 52 or so people died who are probably people who understood what lake effect snow was. Um, and I guess in a way, this, this, this idea of semantic satiation, where if you hear it so much, it kind of loses its meaning. You don't really react to it. So I think going to uh, Joseph's point, uh, you have to have people at the table who can help you hit that plain speak, you know, that right tenor with the messaging. Because even if you have people who are familiar with, with systems, sometimes that familiar language is what lulls them into a false sense of security. And I see that in Florida all the time. So um, the other the other word that I see uh, sort of lose its value is the word accessibility. It means different things to different people. Uh, a person with a wheelchair, accessibility means one thing that, that differs for somebody who needs uh, sign language or who needs 508 compliant you know, websites from the county to understand the uh, nature of the threat. So I think accessibility is another word we can do a better job of parsing so that we don't uh, underestimate how that resonates with people and it may miss the mark if we're assuming that it means one thing. And I think sometimes we often use it that way uh, a little too much. Thank you both. Are there questions from the audience? Okay, Andrea, I see your hand first and then Mickey. <laughs> um, this question is for, for you, Sherman. Um, a lot of the issues, especially for instance, for instance, the example you gave us with the fire and your own decision making process, um, a lot of that seems necessarily less to do with communication and more to do with resources. Um, you were making a calculus that, you know, I don't 
I think was okay. I mean, it was based on your own experience and your own needs. And I think that's probably true in a lot of cases. You know, I, I heard stories from Hurricane Ian, a lot of elderly, you know, have different risk calculuses when it term, comes to going to a shelter for the same reasons, because am I going to have to sleep on the floor? I'm 80. Um, and so I guess the question here is how much do we focus on communication versus actually bringing in these better resources and then communicating that we have those resources to get um, to to really provide for people who need I don't think it'd be, it can be an either or proposition. I think you almost have to do both because the communication comes in layers. You know, it's not FEMA, but not the first messages. It's, you know, a lot of decision makers at the state and county levels, the sheriffs, you know, all those people, they're the ones that are going to decide whether they're going to make, you know, police units available to come rescue somebody who, who underestimated how fast the floodwater was coming in or how bad the storm surges were going to be. Um, so they're gonna have to live with the consequences of it. So oftentimes they're the ones that know the community the best, but the resources does become the thing. You know, I, I had resources, but I still did not feel like I was going to be in a better position than if I just waited out and maybe, um, you know, let's see how bad this will get before I really have to take that step. Uh, looking back on it, it wasn't a great decision only because I know how bad it can get. Now, if I never had this job, I probably would have thought, um, you know, good decision. And I probably will be in another wildfire and make the same mistake. And it could be again at my peril. And that's part of the problem is people think that, you know, because they've gone through 10 hurricanes that this one will be different until it makes that turn and washes away parts of the country. And, and, and a lot of people don't want to hear about climate change, but there are weather systems hitting areas of the country where it didn't hit before. And that's a reality. And so you've got places that are not prepared on top of the fact that People are under-resourced, so um, it could have a cumulative effect, but I think that's why the best opportunity we have is to have people sit, and even if it's not adequate, talk through it. Like, give people an understanding of what they're going to be up against, and um, and then hopefully um, they'll find the resources if they, you know, if, if they're not provided, they'll find a way to prepare and access those resources. Mickey? Mickey? Thank you to you both. That was really powerful hearing from both of you. So I have a policy question. Um, so what pressing policy do you think your agency needs to create or implement that would best help these populations that you mentioned? So Sherman, if you could say what you think FEMA should be doing. Joseph, I know you don't formally work for NOAA or the Weather Service, but feel free to say what you think they should do. So. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Sherman. And thank you, Mickey. No, yeah, honestly, I think really just fundamentally, we need to first even define what a translation means for an agency. One of the very first issues we ran upon when we started embarking on this bilingual risk communication work is when we were pro providing these recommendations, uh, agencies would say, no, great. This is, it's great to see that, you know, the data shows that these words are resonating more with the community. We'd be happy to change it. But wouldn't it be a little troublesome if the English and Spanish didn't line up necessarily? And well, like when you really think about it, when you're bilingual, you realize that words technically aren't directly translated all the time. And that that was one of the very first instances where I thought, well, like we should really just define what a translation means for a lot of these agencies, because that's probably why we're having these issues of creating different variations of translations is we're too worried about directly translating the word rather than the meaning of it overall. And so I think that would be a fundamental first step for a lot of governmental agencies to consider what does translation mean? And after defining it, actually start to implement some of these things. Because if we are more concerned now about about translating the meaning of, of given uh, words overall, then yeah, we'd be able to move a lot more quicker when it comes to actually creating words out there, making sure they're consistent, and most importantly, making sure that they resonate with the community. One of the biggest, um, I'll call it a challenge. One of the biggest challenges coming into FEMA and doing the work that I do was first ha having the, the culture of the agency understand that there are certain points in the disaster where if you wait too long, it's too late. And because we're a reactive agency by design, I mean, there's a there's a declaration process for a reason. States have autonomy. Tribal territories have autonomy. You know, so you can't just have the feds come in and rush in and, and take over. Um, but there does become a point when there are diminishing returns to the communication because you can't you've you've the people have no decision-making capacity at some point. 
and they're they're at the mercy of the of the circumstances. Um, so one of the policy changes that I sort of uh, you know um, enculturated was the idea that for the disability population, preparedness is the first response, and that means that during that pre landfall period, even though we're not in there, you know, urban search and rescue is getting staged and all the things are happening, we have to begin to profile the risk as accurately as we can, anticipate that there are going to be things we don't know, um, but try to be as certain as we can and have relationships with those community stakeholders and empower them with enough information to sort of set conditions so that we'll be successful when we come in. I'll give you a good example is up in the Northeast right now, you've got a lot of flooding in areas where people aren't used to it. And one of the questions I had for the state um, was, uh, are you alerting people who are on uh, who are electricity dependent about the nature of the rolling blackouts that are going to be necessary? You know, now can FEMA do, we can't, we can't necessarily do that per se, but I can tell you if that's not, if that communication isn't going out to those people, you're going to start to have people in dire straits that would have been uh, mitigatable had they had information ahead of time. So I'm always looking at blackout situations as an opportunity. And I'm not talking about where it just happened like a tornado. I'm talking about where they're going to have to shut it off to do certain work. We know how many people are electricity dependent. You got to put something out. So I think that that more proactive posture is slowly seeping in and I'm making my way around all the program offices because again, we're a reactive agency by design, but in some cases we can't be reactive or if, if we are reactive, it's an anticipatory reactive, you know, that's kind of a, you know, um, counterintuitive, but if we anticipate a threat, um, we're already probably too deep into it to react to it, but we have to begin to communicate to people and give them information so that they can make good decisions. All right. Thank you so much. I think we need to take a break now. So thank you again for we can 